Today is going to be the second round of ion channels. That, if you want a, <laughs> do you want a donut? Impressive. Uh, today is ion channels again, and just to remind you, ion channels are membrane-bound proteins involved in communication. There's three types. There's voltage sensitive, there's ligand sensitive, and there's mechanically sensitive. We s will study a lot about nerves, and they rely on a battery. It's a battery means a constant potential between the inside and the outside. Uh, largely, they're, de they're determined by two channels, two types of channels. One is the sodium channels, and one is the potassium channels. The question is, do these only work for sodium and potassium? The answer is no, absolutely not. They work for calcium, they work for chloride, basically just about anything. Um, okay. And just okay, hold on. Oh, th this this is nice. That a person was a bit confused about the lecture. I really don't understand how they say anything nice, but get this. The new parts of the lecture, you yourself, I don't know, were not clear about, so I got even more confused. Sorry. <laughs> so that's a, the, bad th the bad side. The next comment was, otherwise, Great lecture. <laughs> well, good, thank you. Hopefully I'll be a little bit more clear. Uh, there, were, there was, oh, <coughs> part of the, the subject that I will give a break today. The fourth comment is that, you know, about anything that would be helpful. Break, break, break. I got it. Okay, and there was lots of comments about inactivation and how the nerve pulse is in fact a pulse, and we'll <coughs> get, get to that. Okay, so I, men I mentioned that that in humans, for example, she has a mutation that basically makes her leg shake. It turns out that there's a mutation, which actually I work on, a mutation in fruit fly, which is called shaker potassium channel. And there was initially discovered in the fruit fly because you give them ether and that knocks them out. But then when you remove the ether, the legs start shaking and you'll see. Oh, her legs start shaking. And that's because there's a particular mutation in the potassium uh, channel that causes this, and ultimately though the same thing that causes this is, cause, is, is causing what is going on with the, the woman that we saw. Okay, this is just by way of review, though pay attention because in a minute I'm going to ask you to, in effect, to reproduce this. So what happens is we, by the way, there's donuts, 
Eric, if, if you want. So we have a little bit of calcium. Uh, actually, before we have this, we have a certain potential over here, which we call zero outside, and it's about minus 60 millivolts, minus 100 millivolts. Basically, you can determine what the magnitude of that is by knowing the concentration of sodium and potassium, and then applying your Boltzmann factor and the partition function to it, and you'll get either it'll be minus 60 millivolts if it's uh, potass potassium or plus 60 millivolts if it's open to sodium. So what happens is you have little calcium comes in, it raises the potential in here from minus 60 volts to some value a little bit less, minus 50, minus 40. What happens is it makes the, the sodium channels tend to open. More sodium, or sodium starts to come in. Sodium is plus, so that makes it from minus voltage to some somewhat higher, which causes more channels to open. And basically, it's, it keeps going. And then at some point, the sodium channel says, I've had enough, and it starts to shut off. At that point, though the potassium channels, which look just the same as this, start to open, and it starts to open, there's a high concentration of potassium on the inside, so the potassium starts rushing out, and that further brings the membrane potential down. And so if you, you add up the things, that looks like that. And by the way, after a while, the potassium channel says, okay, I've had enough, and start shutting off. And eventually, you come back to zero. By the way, yeah, there we go. <laughs> That's pretty good. And he's, he's an undergraduate, right? Yeah, wow, he's really, you're ready for graduate school. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever they have meetings, I just go up there and have some time. Okay. I guess, I guess I, I've, I've helped you prepare for graduate school. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Um, okay, and it turns out the amount of sodium or potassium flowing through it actually does not need to be large in order to cause this change in the <coughs> potential. Okay. We had the question of why does the action potential move and why is it a pulse rather than just a spread? Because initially, the sodium channels are open. It comes in here. There's some excess sodium in here. They diffuse around, and diffusion, it doesn't really care whether it goes this way or that way. It comes over here. There is then a little bit excess of positive charges over here, which will tend to make this guy open, and then it more comes in and tends to make this guy open, but also it tends to make this guy open. Whoops. Is there anything op over here? No. In general, the, the action potential starts at one end of the neuron and not in the middle. That's the way these th things are just made. So it tends to propagate in that direction. Okay, it tends to, yeah? Uh, so the question, is that the end of all of this? Wait, you, you said that you were really tired. I am. 
And you still have energy to ask a question? Yeah. Wow, okay. Um, so at the end of all of this, um, since oh, huh? sodium is flowing in and potassium is flowing out, yeah. when all the channels are closed, would the polarity switch then? So would it have high potassium on the outside and low sodium on the outside? Like basically would everything flip? <laughs> the the uh, uh, amount of sodium ions that are coming through or the amount of potassium ions that are flowing out is actually very small. That the, so the concentration stays pretty much the same? The concentration stays pretty much the same. Although, of course, it's not yeah. exactly the same. And so eventually, you do need something that will reestablish the, the exactly. And that, in fact, is what is the role of the sodium potassium pump. Because okay. that takes ATP. <coughs> and you can do that. <coughs> oh. So, how many did you have? <laughs> no, no, I don't know. <laughs> Oh, he, he, he has like, he, he's walking around. <laughs> you, oh, he, he's looking, go ahead. Really? Okay. Oh, yeah, really. I, I didn't want to interrupt. Not a bad choice. Okay. So the question is still, why isn't it, a, a pulse, I, wh why isn't it just a, a spreading rather than a distinct pulse and going down? And the reason is, is after a while, this guy shuts off. We'll talk about why it shuts off, but for now, just believe that it does. So sodium comes in, diffuses out, activates this, but this guy then shuts off. And then this guy, some of it diffuses and turns this guy on, and eventually this guy shuts off. So it looks like a pulse. Yes? What turns on the net? It activates the next step. Ah, well, it, what it, it, this is dependent whether it's open or closed on the voltage. And what I'm, I'm saying is that when it's at minus six, 60 millivolts, the sodium, the sodium channel is off. If the potential is, let's say, you know, minus 40 millivolts, there, there is mostly it's off, but some fraction will be on. So if you compare the two dogs, the time it takes to propagate the, the potential and the, the time it takes to uh, diffuse the design channels, do you think it's not? No, they're, they're not. They're, 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 they're basically the same. Advance the next channel being activated, plus you have now uh, a reverse, kind of reverse. Oh, what, what, what happens is this channel gets activated, and so it, letting more sodium gets through. But then after a certain period of time, let's say a few milliseconds, this guy shuts off. And so this is off, and let's say this guy is off, but now over here, a certain number of are on. What's the band speed? What's the average density? Ah, uh, the average density is really high. It's very short distance. In fact, they need to be basically close together. You have like 10,000 of these per micron. It's amazing. Yes. Good question. How does this protein 
know about what the voltage is? Very good question, and we will answer that. Yes. By the way, very, has anybody not had a donut who would like one? Anyway, the, you can feel free to interrupt at any point and we'll make fun of you, but. <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned first it's closed and while like positive charges are going toward the channel, it's just like. What, 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 <laughs> one thing that I just have to do. When he interrupted me, which was really rude. No, just kidding. Uh, but he, he was nice about it. He said, sir, and then asked, don't call me sir. Call me Paul. Call me, Paul will be just fine. Go ahead. It was like, I won't call you at all. Just like raise your hand. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry, so go ahead. It's closed and of course it's in minus 60, it's closed. When it goes to minus 40 uh, millivolt, like part of it will be open. As far as I remember, you said like it's a digital one. Either it's like closed or open. So how is it Good, open? good question. What do, what do I mean by partly open and is it in fact not digital? We'll get to that in just a second. Okay, for now what I want you to do is I want you to fill in each of these spots, this yellow, what is happening with the sodium and the potassium channel. Then in the green, what's happening with the sodium potassium channel. Then in the, in the blue, what's happening with the sodium potassium. And then this, what does the sodium, the conductance look like and what the, does the potassium look like? So I want you to do that. And I want you to do this because it will be on the final, okay? So you have two minutes. Somebody is gonna come up here and do it, but the... Are you two in conversation? Uh, it will be. It starts to get going. Okay, go ahead. Come on. Get going. Also, Professor, at what point is the voltage being measured? Like outside of the cell or inside? Outside is always zero. Okay. If, by definition. Okay. And there, therefore, you're measuring the voltage inside. Okay. So, the positive ion is going to you have it, Greg? Do you have it? What class? Okay. So it is. Everybody is going to get an A plus on the exam. 
Does everybody know how to do this? Yeah. The idea is you not only know what happens, but you know why it happens. So who wants to come up here and be Professor Paul or Sir? Sir Paul. Sir, there we go. That's good. <laughs> Sir Paul. Come on. Oh, right. Here we go. Go ahead. Could, could you turn on the light? You can do whatever you want. Is that okay? So here we see that um, the voltage starts, starts dropping down. So that means, well, basically what happens is that the sodium channel flows and potassium channel starts off. And then we're returning so, back to the remaining potential, and here we have more potassium going in, and I guess overflowing. But at this point, we're coming back to the to the remainder potential, so potassium channel is actually flooded. It's quite more small. Does that make sense? Okay. How can the calcium ion come to the cell? Did we ask how can calcium ion? Are there calcium channels in the cell? So, uh, there are calcium channels, and I think that there is. So, when we have uh, the cell soma and then the axon. Um, I think there's mitochondria, and once we get a signal here, I think there's a calcium influx. So that's why the calcium, yeah. I think, begins here. That's why we can start propagating the action potential in this direction. Yeah, in, in fact, we haven't gone over how you get your initial input of calcium. So. Uh, uh, for now, yeah, let's just I take take yeah. Let's just take it as is. But uh, well, I, I had a question, but you you answered it because I was about to ask what the calcium. Okay, just take it from okay. God named Paul. <laughs> so how'd she do? I would give her an, an absolutely an A for 
effort, I'd give her excellent uh, up here. But then I, I think I have a disagreement. First, one thing that wasn't covered is the magnitude of this. Okay, okay, that's, that's fair. What, what, what about the magnitude of this? Remember when we had a, just a membrane it was sensitive to, we said just sodium or sensitive to just potassium. What did we find out based on the, the Boltzmann factor if it was sensitive to just sodium and there was 150 millimolar on one side and 15 millimolar on another, what potential would it reach? It would reach about plus 60. So depending exactly on the, the concentrations, it, it's going to go up to basically the maximum. And in this case, okay, it says plus 30. But okay, so it, it goes up here, and then K plus opens, that's good. And then what, why does it fall? Yeah, Wait, it, it, he just had an exam in this in another course. So let's assume that he got an A plus. And, bad okay, bad, okay, go ahead, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, it's like this K plus is leaving the uh, cell membrane. Okay. So okay. you're having positive charges. Okay, wh wh which way is it going? Is it going into the cell or out of the cell? So in fact, positive ions going out makes the inside more negative. Okay, so good. So K plus is le leaving the cell, and what's happening is, in fact, in, indeed, the sodium channels are starting to, to close, and so they're not doing very much. Okay, and how do we get this? We actually apparently get a little bit of overshoot and then it, it comes back. How do we get it to come back? Well, we need potassium channels to be open. Right, potassium channels to be open, and then eventually the potassium channels close. Okay. So, yeah, that, that, this is essentially what she said. Okay, now we can give Monica. Okay, okay, and, and this is just the difference. And so just remember, you have a membrane which is sometimes permanent to sodium, sometimes perm permanent to potassium. <laughs> if it's permanent, permanent to sodium, you get like plus 59, Permian to sodium, you get minus 59. So you can switch between the two by making it alternately <clears throat> sensitive to sodium or sensitive to potassium. And that's the whole idea of what these channels do, is they open and close. And you, okay, and we've done it, okay. And so we get something that looks like this. This is the probability of open. Should remind you a lot of the Boltzmann factor. And what happens is there's two factors. There's how steep this is, and oh, what else? And also where it is in terms of the midpoint potential. So this is very important. The midpoint potential, what, what is that going to be determined by? Come on. OK. 
we, we have the answer lady here. Go ahead. How fast they flow. No. Yeah. The number of ions in what, when, or what do, you, what do you mean by the number of ions? Uh, so when uh, ions are flowing, you know, let's assume ions are in the one side, not the one side, and they are flowing through the side. And if we are concerned about the rate of potential initially, you know, when they start flowing, okay, this is the maximum. Okay, well, the, the, this, the, the one half is in this case at minus 30 millivolts, right? Or it could be, you know, minus 20 or minus 60. So what is determining that value? No, uh, in terms of, let's say there, there's nothing flowing, just for example. What will the potential be? Zero? Minus 0.1 volts or minus 60 millivolts or minus 80 millivolts because it depends on the concentration of the sodium inside, sodium outside, the potassium inside, the potassium outside, but just like we, we calculated. So the midpoint potential is, it depends on basically the concentration of the sodium and potassium. And this, you can see is depending on Q times V. Q is the number of charges that are moving as a function of the movement of ion channels. And this goes back to the important question about why is the channel opening or closing depending on the voltage? Apparently, in fact, apparently what you have is there are two types of charges going on here. This is always a little confusing. There's the charges of the sodium or the charges of the potassium. That's called your ionic current, okay? That's like just what he says. The number of sodium or the number of potassium flowing through. That's the, your ion. There's another charge with, which is within the ion channel. That is because there are amino acids that are charged. And these guys are moving slightly such that when it's for example, minus 60 millivolts here, the channel is closed, and when it's at zero millivolts, the channel is open, for example. So those are generally called gating currents because they have to do with opening and closing the gate. So what, what you can get from this is you can get QV 
that is, the slope of this means there is more charges, more gating charges that are apparently moving. Questions? So I have a feeling some people, this has gone somewhat. Yes, okay, good. So, uh, yeah, okay. to the P over, like for instance here, for instance in this case, we have like minus 30 millivolts. Does it relate to the P delegate, like if the sodium panel closed and the calcium opens, does it relate at all? Or it, it, you have a graph like this that you can fit to this. Therefore, it, it has, you know, it, it, could, it could have been like that or it could have been like that, okay? The, the Q times the, the halfway point is a function of how much gating charge there is. For example, Let's say that there was no gating charge, none whatsoever. The, the ion channel, it isn't sensitive. Well, it has no gating charge. So let's say you change the channel. Uh, I'm sorry, you change the voltage. Is it going to feel an effect? No, it's not going to be voltage sensitive at all. Okay, therefore, if you want it to be voltage sensitive, you have to put some charge in it because then if the charge moves, then you have a different energy. Remember, there's two states of this. One has an energy of E1 and one has an energy of E2, right? That's how, we, remember, we, we did the Boltzmann constant, and we said that the, the probability goes, let's say, as open over, this is the probability of of open plus right and so there must be a difference in the energy between it being closed and being open that energy is the simplest thing is imagine that it's just charge times some voltage. That's the model that we're using. And the model actually works out very well. Okay? okay. And, and uh, effectively, this is what uh, I'm doing. And if there's more charge, I said QV, let's say Q is, can be one or two or three or whatever, it will, it will change the energy levels 
and change this slope. So it means, I mean, like, if the slope instead of being this much, if it's like this, it means that it's more sensitive to yeah, exactly. the charge. Different in it, di differences in vol voltage. In and out. In and out. That's right. And it's more sensitive because the this Q doesn't have to do with the ionic charge. It has to do with the so-called gating charge, right? Uh, which has to do with, in this case, Amino acids. And like if it's more sensitive, <clears throat> instead of, for instance, instead of being activated around minus fifty, it's activated around minus fifty-five. Right. Yeah. Or minus thirty, or minus a hundred. Okay. That's right. That's right. So by generating a curve like this, you can determine what the value of Q is, the number of gating charges that are effectively moving. Okay, and how are we going to do this? First, let's talk about whether the charge, uh, whether the thing is opening or closing or gradually or all at once. Okay, turns out to do this requires a, a Nobel Prize, which is awarded in 1991 for so, some me method that Sockman and Nair pioneered, and that is you take a cell and you jab it, and then you pull. And it turns out that what you do, when you pull it up, you'll get, on average, like one, one ion channel. And then you put it in a, in a machine that essentially measures the current. And what you can see is the current is off or the current is on. Yes. That was, that, was the that was the technique that the, got the Nobel Prize. The, the, the thing about it is, you know, you have one <coughs> ion channel in there, just one. So the amount of current is actually very small when you open or close it. And therefore, it's like picoamps. So in order to measure how much voltage there is, V equals IR. I is a picoamp. R better be huge in order to get a reasonable voltage. R being really large means it's a gigaohm seal, where it turns out that that's very difficult or was very difficult at the time. Now, in fact, you know, they can regularly do this. So there's a question? Okay. So they can do this. And then, so what, what you have, could, could I have someone, can you turn off the front lights? Yeah, thank you. So on this, for an ensemble, you see this. What you do is you put your single ion channel and then you flip a switch and you go from negative potential to less negative or positive. And what you see is the amount of current is zero and then it immediately goes down, in this case, about a picoamp. It stays on, and then it shuts off. <coughs> and again, same thing, and then shuts off at a little different time. And then a little bit, it shuts off at a little different time. 
And what you do is you can then add all of these up, and in fact, you get a curve that looks just like this. Oh, though this is negative of that. So in fact, what you have is you have a sodium channel that you change the voltage, it opens, and it opens all it can do. It opens, and then it shuts off at various times. And the aggregate is exactly what you see. So these are little transi transistors that they're, they're on and off. In this case, with two conducting states. OK, so in fact, this is what you do at negative voltage, everything's off, and then you start increasing the voltage, and occasionally you get them on, and you look at the probability of being open as a function of voltage, you get this. You can then determine what QA, the number of gating charges that there are, and it turns out that Q is about 13 or so electron equivalents. So that means that there must be some arginines or some lysines or something with charge on it which is moving from the outside to the inside. And in fact, what they did is they looked at what the potassium or the sodium channel looked like. This happens to be the sodium channel. Uh, I'm sorry, this happens to be the potassium channel. It turns out the potassium channel is made of four proteins, four more or less identical proteins. And it basically looks like this, with, sodium, with potassium can running through the middle or get stopped. And if you look at any one channel, it has what is called six transmembranes. One, then two, and then three, and then four, five, and six. Now, what happens is you can look, so we're trying to find out where is the equivalent of 12 electron of charges. Ordinarily, do you, are you likely to have more charges in, he, in the membrane or, or, or over here? Because somehow you have to move 12 electron equivalents you know, from about here to about here. So where are they likely to be found? In here or here? Okay, I'll, I'll give you a minute to think about this, and then we'll talk about it, and then, in fact, we'll have our break. Okay, so uh, again, we have 12 electrons because 12 electrons times the voltage is, is basically a difference in energy between this and this. And so we're searching for 12 electrons equivalent. And where is it likely to be? Is it here or is it inside the membrane? Go ahead, think about it.
Yeah. Uh, assume the positive charges. So what what's the difference between of a membrane and the water in terms of hydrophobicity. So wh which is more hydrophobic, the, in the membrane or outside of the membrane? In the, it, yes. Okay, so it, if you're going to have, you know, a bunch of something like this, it, are you going to ha have within the membrane, I mean, are they going to tend to be hydrophobic or hydrophilic? Right, they will tend to be hydrophobic in here and hydrophilic in here. It, now, our, our goal, though, is we have some 12 electron equivalents and, you know, we want to bring it over here in one state or up here in another state. So what we're going to do is in general these are going to be hydrophilic but in fact there there's going to be a series of positive charges in inside and the thought is that when there you go from here to here and you change the potential a lot, Q times V. This is quite unusual to have a membrane ion uh, uh, membrane protein to be positively charged inside the membrane. It takes a lot of energy. So it, again, we have 12 electrons equivalent, so divided by four, because you have four per channel, that's eff effectively three per, per, per subunit. And it turns out, so they looked at this, and they found that, in fact, they were normally all hydrophobic except for this transmembrane region called S4 and that they found some positive charges there. And so they were very confident that in fact S4 
somehow was moving like a dipole. Move, moving toward the plus and then minus. And it turns out that that actually was completely correct. So if you, this is just an example of two proteins. This is hydrophilic, this is hydrophobic. So there, that means it's hydrophobic, and therefore it tends to be membrane spanning. And uh, uh, this shouldn't say membrane spanning, but it means it, it's hydrophilic. Okay, and now, now it's time for a break. Okay, two minutes, go ahead. Okay, so let, let's see if we can finish this off. That is, we now have the ion channel, which is sensitive to sodium or sensitive to potassium. That is zero volts minus 0.1 volts. It somehow must know about what the voltage is and undergo some sort of change which opens the channel or closes the channel, right? <clears throat> How is it gonna do that? Well, the simplest way that it can know about it is if it contains some charge that is this is charge in the protein itself, which feels the effect of this electric field. The simplest model is there's some charge, and it's, it feels charge times the voltage. And it, it can feel a charge of, let's say, what, uh, a voltage, Q times V. The voltage is zero, it has some energy state. Then it, let's say the charge is, uh, the, the voltage is minus 0.1 volts. Therefore, it feels a charge of minus Q times 0.1 volts. What we found it, from the slope is that the charge is equivalent to three electrons per subunit, that is 12 electron equivalents for the whole four transmembrane regimes. And now the question is, how does it move? You can imagine a situation where the simplest situation is that it just moves up and down like a piston. Or you could imagine that something is doing a rotation that, for example, it is here and the ions are flowing through it. It, it reaches here and it can't go through. And then, in fact, the ion channel opens up and it swings and then lets it through. <coughs> so that this has been a very big source of controversy. And in fact, Rod McKinnon, who won a Nobel Prize, I had conversations with him, and let me tell you, apparently if you win a Nobel Prize, you are extremely dogmatic. <laughs> Unbelievable, unbelievable. He came up, what said, 
okay, it wasn't a, a piston, but actually it was more like a, a paddle. That's one possibility. Another possibility that I had come up with is that it was more like a twist in that by undergoing a twist that you would ne you could nevertheless take some of this positive charge and move it across the membrane. Now, let me tell you that Rod McKinnon won the Nobel Prize and he, and he deserves it because, no, he, he did a lot of amazing sort of crystallography. I think doesn't matter what I think. <laughs> I, I don't know, I'm trying to put it nicely. Okay. What happened in the conversation that you're so bad at? <laughs> I, 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 actually, I, uh, it, it, I thought the conversation went very well. I told them our results which it turns out were based on what we call FRET, which I'll just give you the little bit about. And he was like, oh, it makes a lot of sense. And then to tell him another result, and oh, it make, makes a lot of sense. And then oh, I said, okay, great, Rod. Nice conversation. I hung up. Next day or two, I talked to what was his thesis defense, his thesis advisor, a guy named Chris Miller, who's a bigwig in this. And he sa said, oh, you don't know Rod. There's no question that he'll think of something that will show, or will supposedly show, how your result are, is completely wrong or opposite, and his model of a paddle mo model is completely correct. And I'm, I was like, what are you talking about? And he just like Chris said about Rod, you just wait, you'll see. And he, Chris was totally correct. Anyways, <laughs> what we did is we did what's called FRET, which is fluorescence resonance energy transfer. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but what I'm going to tell you about is FRET involved, involves labeling A protein, in this case, happens to be ion channel. <coughs> it, at two sites, you label one is called, you put a donor on, and you put an acceptor on. Okay? And the idea, so, the donor is, let's say, green, and the acceptor is red. And if they're far apart, you essentially see no signal. If, however, they're close together, like a scissor, then, in fact, you see a lot of interaction between the two. So you come in and you excite the green, the donor, if the if the acceptor is far away, you see a lot of green fluorescence, and you basically don't see hardly any red fluorescence. However, if the donor and acceptor are close together, then what happens is you go and excite the green, but instead of fluorescing, 
essentially all of the energy is transferred to the acceptor and the acceptor fluoresces. And so depending on the distance, we'll, you'll see either a lot of green fluorescence or red fluorescence. And so you can actually differentiate between these models. And I'm not going to go, go into it, but our model completely excludes the paddle model and is very much in support of a rotation model. And this argument went on for several years. And I think at this point that I've won, but if you asked Rod, So th that's enough of that. Okay, last thing I want to get to is, remember we talked about the sodium channel or the potassium channel, and then it spontaneously shut off? The question is, why does it spontaneously shut off? And there's a very simple model, a ball and chain model, as to why it shuts off. And you can imagine that the, the, the channel looks like this. Th this is the inside of the cell. This is the outside of the cell. And imagine that the channel is here and it has a little ball connected via a chain that is a, a little polypeptide. When this ball is off, the channel is free to flow. But then when the channel with this ball and chain sticks in here, then it's off. And this is not voltage dependent. This is just a matter of that it has a particular shape such that the ball and chain can go in there. So what you do is you take the, the channel, and you snip through molecular biology, you snip off the ball and chain. So you have the wild type with the ball and chain. Notice it comes on, but then it comes off. You snip it, and it comes on, and it stays on forever. Furthermore, what you can do is you can take it where you've snipped the ball and chain such that it's like this, but then you add in the ball and chain free into solution. And eventually, this should be able to come off. And as you increase the amount of the concentration of the ball and chain, it should go off more rapidly. And so here you do the mutant plus the pep free peptide, and it goes off again. So this was really an absolutely beautiful experiment. Um, I guess the last thing that we'll do, and we'll do it the class afterwards is actually a crystallography experiment, which in fact was do done by Rod McKinnon to look at the 
channel in a little bit more detail. So at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a chance. Yeah, right. Um, uh, first, uh, I want to wish you a happy Thanksgiving. Um, I hope that for those of you who need the sleep, that you get enough sleep. For those of you who are not vegetarian, I hope you go and enjoy killing some turkeys. Uh, uh, the other thing is there is, a, I think it's, Not, not ISIS, that, that's the Syrian group. Uh, the, the, the evaluation forms, what, what are they, they no, called? The difference probably no, ICES. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, uh, yeah, <laughs> really. Uh, well, please, I'd appreciate it if you actually fill it out. Don't be thinking of the Mideast when you're doing it, because that'll be really bad. Uh, but if you would think about what has been good and what has been bad, and in fact, there's a place where you can put your comments there, that will really help me in terms of for the, the things you liked and the things you didn't like. So um, have a good Thanksgiving. <laughs>